A face screams in terrible agony. In the darkness, you can't quite make out the shape of its body, but it doesn't look human. It's large and square, almost boxy. Two things you should know. This is a fate worse than death, and it isn't the only one. It's a busy but ordinary day in Hangzhou, China. People are rushing to and from work, going to school, going for walks, buying a hot meal and a cup of tea. But for one young police officer, this is a monumental day. He has been assigned the biggest case of his career, and he grips the stack of files with sweaty, trembling hands as he considers the weight of this moment. It isn't just one case, not really. It's actually six. Six separate missing person cases that he's beginning to suspect might be connected. Our detective wishes he could take a moment and transport himself away from these harrowing missing person cases and clear his head. But while he's unable to, we can. Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Raid Shadow Legends, the hit mobile hero collection RPG played by over 80 million players across the world. And they've got some huge news for both new and returning players, the recently added Live Arena. To tell us about it, I've invited a fellow academic to join us today. Professor Death Knight here with a lesson about Live Arena, the new PvP mode where you can fight against other players in real time. <gasps> Sounds terrifying? Well, so's going to the dentist. You should still do it. Live Arena has a draft feature where you can pick and ban champions to fight for you. <laughs> Teamwork! When you win matches, you'll get Live Arena crests towards unlocking special area bonuses, or so I hear. I'm too afraid to try any of this out. All right, class. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Bob here. What's your personal strategy for Live Arena? Well, everyone thinks I'll go in fighting, but nobody expects my charm. My best strength is the gift of gab. So when they try to attack, I'll just be like, nice weather we're having, eh? Nobody will see it coming. That doesn't sound like a very effective strategy. Do not pick me for Live Arena. Seriously, don't. I'm too young to be bone meal. Well, thank you for your- Class dismissed! Do we have a bell? Oh, we should totally get a bell. Class definitely not dismissed, but there's a bunch of brand new content in Raid Shadow Legends related to the animated limited series Call of the Arbiter, including a free legendary champion, the mighty orc warlord Artak. All you have to do to get him is log into Raid for seven days between now and July 24th. Easy. New players, use my link or scan the QR code right here and get a free starter pack with this cool in-game loot. So just hit my link in the description, and I'll see you on the battlefield. And now, back to the case at hand. The detective was beginning to suspect that the six separate missing person cases might be connected. At first glance, they seem unrelated. The victims have very little in common, except one thing. They all worked at the same office, an office that closed one month ago, a casualty of international corporate downsizing. No one from his police department has bothered to look into this angle, assuming that it will lead back to more dead leads. But the young officer can't shake the feeling that there is important information waiting for him in that abandoned office building. So after finishing up his lunch and dabbing the nervous sweat from his brow with a handkerchief from his pocket, he sets off toward the old office building in hopes of cracking the case wide open. As he makes the trip, he considers some other possible theories. Maybe the missing employees skipped town, overwhelmed and depressed from their unexpected job loss. But would they really let their families worry like this? Some of them have wives, husbands, children, all of whom would notice their absence and assume the worst. No, this isn't a simple case of a group of colleagues all vanishing to blow off steam in another city somewhere. Something bad happened. He can just feel it. Maybe they uncovered corporate secrets and someone decided to silence them before they could blow the whistle. But then again, what sort of secrets would be worth killing for at a printer company? It feels worthless trying to guess, trying to fill in the gaps in his knowledge with wild speculation. The only way to find out was to examine the building for himself and see if he can find any clues at all that lead him to the whereabouts of the missing six. When the young officer reaches the building, he finds the door padlocked shut. Luckily, he prepared for this and brought some industrial strength bolt cutters that snapped the lock into pieces with very little effort. Why lock up the building like this? There can't be anything valuable left inside. To prevent squatters, most likely, he assures himself, brushing off the sense of dread creeping up his spine as he walks inside. As he crosses the threshold of the empty office, the first thing he notices is the smell. It reeks of sulfur and bleach, 
and a whiff of something electrical that stings the inside of his nostrils with each breath. New possibilities turn over in his mind. Perhaps some sort of deadly workplace accident claimed the lives of the missing when they came back in to collect their belongings and clear out the building. Before he can decide if that theory holds any water, his thoughts are interrupted by a piercing scream coming from a nearby room. The officer isn't alone here, there's someone in the building with him, and they sound like they're in trouble. The officer grabs the taser from his holster and runs toward the sound. He skids to a stop, nearly knocking over a water cooler when he reaches the source of the screaming. There's a man hanging from the wall, screaming over and over again. The officer can barely process what he's seeing. The man is covered in machinery, all whirring and clicking as it works. Next to him, a printer is printing sheet after sheet of paper, and all the while, the man screams. The officer recognizes the man's face from one of the files. This is one of the missing employees. He can't determine what is causing the man such distress, and he tries to ask the man what happened to him. The man just continues to scream, eyes wide open and wild, rolling around in their sockets, unfocused and unseeing. The officer grabs the man, attempting to remove him from the wall, but he won't budge. It's as if his body is wired into the wall itself, and the harder the officer tugs, the more it appears as if the man's flesh will begin to tear away. The officer stops, turning his attention to the machinery. Perhaps if he unplugs it, he'll be able to remove the man more easily. He starts with the printer, and as he reaches for its plug, he gets a closer look at the paper it continues to spit out. It doesn't look like any paper he's ever seen, and unable to help himself, he reaches out to touch it. It's warm, soft, pliable, and nauseatingly familiar. It isn't paper at all. It's skin. In that moment, all of the officer's training falls out of his mind, replaced with blind terror. He runs from the building as fast as he can, all the way back to the police station, where he tearfully informs his captain about what he found. This is no longer a police matter, his captain tells him. They need to escalate this to a specialized organization. The young officer is sent home, placed on psychiatric leave, and the next day, the SCP Foundation investigates the building it will come to refer to as SCP-2535. SCP-2535 is a former two-story Hewlett-Packard branch office building in the Zhaoshan district of Hangzhou, China. The building's anomalous nature is characterized by the presence of a detailed network of electrical and biological components of unknown origins. The walls of the building's entire first story are covered with 63,512 USB 2.0 standard A sockets, placed in a grid pattern made up of 20-centimeter semi-regular intervals. Each of these sockets is connected to wires running through the walls, but these are no ordinary wires. They consist of a woven mixture of copper strands and human optic nerve tissue, all wrapped in a layer of keratin. In spite of the inclusion of organic material in their structure, the wires have not shown any signs of decay or deterioration since the Foundation discovered SCP-2535. This curious, off-putting mix of the technological and the biological persists throughout the location and only gets stranger as one moves deeper into the building. If one were to follow the path of these wires, going against their better judgment and the scream of their most primal instincts, they would find that the wires lead to a room on the building's second floor. The room is currently inaccessible, but is thought to have once been the server room. Whatever is blocking the door is large enough that it cannot be budged, and non-intrusive imaging has determined that it is some sort of biological mass. The inside of the former server room, like the wires that lead there, emits heat at a consistent temperature of 47.6 degrees Celsius. Foundation personnel who approached the room have reported a persistent smell of sulfur and ozone coming from inside, as well as the loud sound of a running printer. 317 of the USB socket and power outlets in SCP-2535 are connected to HP brand USB 2.0 compatible devices. Of these devices, 20 have displayed anomalous, potentially ectoentropic functions. But what exactly does that mean? Allow me to elaborate. Just remember, you asked for this. Don't blame me if you aren't able to stomach the details. There are five former employees of the Hewlett-Packard Hangzhou branch still located inside of SCP-2535. These employees are in an anomalous sort of status, requiring no sleep, food, or water in spite of their continued, seemingly endless consciousness. Since the building's discovery in April of 2013, they have not changed in any way, or at least not in any visible way. All attempts to remove these former employees from their, let's call them predicaments, have proven unsuccessful. 
Allow me to discard any euphemism and explain just what exactly became of these unfortunate workers. First, there is Guo Pingping, the former branch manager. He can be found in the bathroom near the receptionist's desk on the first floor. Goa's head has been forced into the feed tray of a DP DeskJet 1112 printer, which is plugged into the wall. This is troubling for a number of reasons, one of which is that the internal dimensions of this particular DeskJet model's feed tray are not large enough to accommodate a human head, and its components are not strong enough to crush a human skull into a shape that would fit. Nonetheless, Goa's head is firmly lodged into the feed tray. One would assume this would have killed him, but his body continues to move, kicking and thrashing about as if he is in pain. The former assistant branch manager, James Gu Yonggun, is located in the employee pantry on the building's second floor. His body is attached to the wall in a vertical position, held there via 92 20-inch USB 2.0 M-M cables. Five additional cables have been used to secure the actuating unit of an HP DeskJet 2540 all-in-one printer to Gu's lower jaw. The arm of the actuating unit is also attached to a single HP-10 original ink cartridge in the color black. This ink cartridge is attached into Gu's throat at a continuous rate of one stroke per second and, in defiance of the known properties of ordinary ink cartridges, has yet to run out of ink in the years since its discovery. Gu appears to be partially conscious, but is unable to communicate intelligibly when addressed. The former Human Resources Department head, Angel Li Huimin, is still in her former office on the second floor though she no longer performs the duties of her old position. She is still, in a sense, in human resources, or rather, is a human resource. I apologize, sometimes I have to make a joke to cope with the dark subject matter at hand, but Angel's fate is no laughing matter. Like Goo, she is attached to the wall via a series of USB cables. There is an additional cable, one of unspecified length, inserted into her lower abdomen, which is slightly distended, as though filled with a foreign object. Though a proper analysis has not yet been conducted, the variety of sounds and motions originating from the area seem to indicate that there is a fully operational HP USB single station thermal receipt printer lodged near her small intestine. As a consequence of this, a never ending stream of thermal receipt paper is pouring from Angel's mouth at all times, causing her considerable pain and distress. Wang Liang, the former head of the IT department, is permanently placed near the water cooler on the first floor. Like the others, he's bound to the wall by several USB cables, 37 to be exact. There are 12 HP ScanJet 200 scanners pressed against his body, all switched on and running at all times. Next to him, an HP DeskJet 1112 printer is attached to the wall and constantly printing out sheets of… something. A closer inspection reveals that it is not paper, but rather, sheets of skin. He is conscious, but no successful interview with Wang has been conducted due to his nearly constant, wordless screams of agony. The fifth human subject found in SCP-2535 is Chen Yupeng, who once worked as a trainee technical writer. Now he spends his days in the branch manager's office on the second floor of the building. His body has been wedged into the paper tray and backup paper tray of an HP LaserJet Pro 500 multifunction printer, which has been plugged into the wall via a standard power cable and a 3 feet USB 2.0 M-M cable. His head sticks out of an aperture, cut into the side of the printer. The printer itself functions normally, printing copies of the HP standard print quality diagnostic page and the HP LaserJet 500 technical repair manual, alternating between the two. Since SCP-2535's discovery, it has not run out of either paper or ink. Chen himself is unconscious and shows signs of severe blood loss that, under ordinary circumstances, likely would have resulted in death by now. During a preliminary inspection of the building, one Foundation operative discovered a Canon PIXMA E480 printer in the first floor janitor's closet. This printer was dented and heavily corroded, most likely from the application of liquid bleach, and was also covered with human teeth marks. It has spent the most recent several years attempting to print a 91-page document, but has been unsuccessful due to an apparent jam in its paper tray and feed mechanism. The seams of the printer occasionally ooze human blood, which DNA testing has matched to Yan Xiaosha former creative consultant of the Hangzhou branch. SCP-2535 must be sealed away from the public under the guise of health and safety concerns. At least two agents are to be stationed in a nearby building at all times for the purposes of observation. Wherever possible, the inside of SCP-2535 must be soundproofed. All material generated by the building's anomalies must be collected and disposed of on a daily basis. So far, these containment measures have been sufficient to keep civilians away from SCP-2535. 
As far as the friends and family of the missing employees know, their loved ones were never found. It's better that they think of them as lost or dead, rather than learn what truly became of them. As I was poring over the file for SCP-2535, something curious caught my attention. This is not the only anomaly catalogued by the SCP Foundation concerning a branch of the Hewlett Packard Corporation. I considered leaving well enough alone, but I've never been particularly good at that. When another path presents itself to me, no matter how dark or foreboding it may seem, I cannot resist the urge to see where it will lead. In this case, the path led me to SCP-2211. SCP-2211 was a collection of four anomalies discovered in the Shanghai offices of Hewlett Packard. Notice that I said, was, rather than is. More on that later. First, allow me to describe the nature of each anomaly. SCP-2211-1 is a 932MB video file titled simply longsmile.wmv. When played, the video depicts a pair of lips on the right edge of the screen. The lips hold a closed mouth smile for a moment, then open to reveal teeth. At this point in the video, the camera pans to the right, revealing more and more teeth, seemingly forever. Though the length of the video file is listed as 55 seconds, testing revealed that the file will continue to play, revealing endless, maddening rows of teeth for more than 150 straight hours. It will possibly run even longer than that, but testing was through before that could be seen. The video has no audio track. When longsmile.wmv is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device used to play it will begin to secrete a small amount of human saliva. A sample of saliva was collected for DNA testing, but the results were inconclusive and did not match any known human being on record. SCP-2211-2 is a 2.0 megabyte audio file entitled EYEE-79.WAV. Each playthrough of the audio file is different, but tends to contain bursts of modulated static that go on for 2 to 10 seconds before being cut off for around 0.3 seconds of silence at a time. Like Long Smile, this file can play for a seemingly infinite amount of time, in spite of its listed length of 3 minutes and 3 seconds. When SCP-2211-2 is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device will begin to secrete a clear fluid, identified as a mixture of water and sodium chloride, amino acids, glutathione, ascorbic acid, and human collagen fibers. Essentially, the device will begin to leak human tears. SCP-2211-3 is a 599 kilobyte file titled r.exe. When this file is run on a computer, it uses up a great deal of memory, causing the device to overheat and its built-in fans to speed up. In spite of the overheating and any damage it might cause, the computer will continue to run until disconnected from its power source. When the file is run for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, air coming through the built-in fans will begin to emit a strong smell of earwax, though no physical traces of earwax have been found. SCP-2211-4 is a USB adapter-powered coffee reheater. When it is plugged into the USB port of a computer, any liquid placed into the container will be heated to approximately 65 degrees Celsius and will also transform into human mucus at a rate of 1 milliliter per minute. This effect is the same whether or not the computer is on. DNA analysis of the mucus revealed that it is a match with the saliva produced by SCP-2211-1. All of this would have been bizarre enough, a series of files and devices that produce human biological material and are seemingly all connected, but something else happened. All instances of SCP-2211 were kept in a pair of containment lockers. However, on June 10, 2014, this containment was breached. I have included a surveillance log transcript that captured the incident. It occurred as follows. Sound of banging metal detected near second floor of Wing B. Door of small item containment locker DAD-2838 is heavily deformed outwards and has experienced a heavy impact from its inside. The sound of banging metal persists for the next three minutes as the door of containment locker DAD-2838 begins to burst outwards. Security teams are deployed to cordon off the area and manage the situation. Containment locker DAD-2838 is fully breached from the inside when a segmented, humanoid arm emerges, extending to reveal numerous joints along its length. Security teams begin opening fire on the arm to little effect. While the video feed shows that the arm terminates in a seven-fingered hand, personnel present on the scene reported a number of fingers ranging from five to approximately 30. 
The arm repeatedly strikes and breaches the containment locker containing SCP-2211-4, approximately 5 meters from containment locker DAD-2838. It subsequently reaches for SCP-2211-4 and pulls it back into containment locker DAD-2838. No further activity detected. Arm presumed to have dematerialized. Following this incident, the containment locker was examined, but no traces of the many-fingered arm were found inside. Further examination of the locker's contents revealed that SCP-2211-1, 2, and 3 had vanished from their storage media. The files were gone. SCP-2211-4, when tested, no longer displayed any anomalous properties. It was just an ordinary coffee heater, though no staff wanted to use it to heat their coffee, no matter how many times it was washed. Head researcher Min declared SCP-2211 uncontained on August 10, 2014. But there was one more unusual finding. The USB drive that once contained SCP-2211-1 was not empty. There was an untitled text file on the drive. When opened, it simply read, Got my my nose, followed by an unusual text emoticon, colon colon o o, end parentheses, end parentheses. As a man of science, one who has devoted my life to exploring the unexplained and seeking answers to questions that most are afraid to even ask, nothing troubles me quite like a mystery left unsolved. But the tales of these Chinese Hewlett Packard offices are composed almost entirely of disturbing mysteries, of frayed wires and broken printers, of survivors that cannot tell their stories, and messages we will never get to read. What happened after that Hangzhou branch closed? Was it connected to the findings at the Shanghai branch? Did that mysterious arm grab hold of the Hangzhou team, contorting their bodies into unrecognizable shapes and forcing them to meld with the products they once sold? Or was it once an employee too, broken down into spare parts and trapped as files and desktop beverage warmers? I can't be certain. But I do know this. I'm throwing out my printer. I think I'll just write my notes by hand from now on. I won't necessarily suggest you do the same, but do be careful while handling the machinery. Treat it with respect. After all, you never know if that printer was once as human as you or me. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2128, The Liar's Cradle, 